Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. At the start of the 17th century, the initial phase of European exploration of the North American continent slowly began to move towards colonization. This early, fledgling colonial movement was in need of strong, talented, and determined leaders. The Roman Catholic countries of Western Europe furnished a market that made the perilous Atlantic Ocean voyage worthwhile, even if it were made just to reach the immensely rich fishing waters to gather the harvest of the sea instead of the spices and jewels of the Orient. Almost every year after John Cabot's historic 1497 voyage, an international mixture of fishing vessels could be seen on the offshore fisheries southeast of Newfoundland and east of Nova Scotia, Canada. Occasionally, such ships even cruised into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. At times, their crews encountered Amerindians along the shores who were willing to part with valuable furs in exchange for articles manufactured in Europe. When it was realized that only the wilds of an unexplored new world had been discovered, there was a spirit of disillusionment in Europe. Gradually, however, this feeling was replaced by a fresh interest in North America, for Spaniard adventurers were reported to be bringing home rich cargoes of gold and silver from the Caribbean and Mexico. Ten years after French monarch Francis I sent navigator Giovanni de Verrazzano on a voyage of reconnaissance overseas, he followed up by dispatching an expedition under skilled mariner Jacques Cartier. On his voyage of 1534, Cartier sailed a route that was for the most part already well known by captains of transatlantic fishing vessels. Cartier's voyage, however, was an official exploring expedition and its immediate result was a thorough report for the French king about the lands he had seen and the people he had met. He visited and named most of the important coasts on the Gulf of St. Lawrence and observed near Anticosti Island that he might be in the mouth of a great river. The mighty St. Lawrence River is a large waterway in the middle latitudes of North America, flowing from Lake Ontario in a northeasterly direction into the world's largest estuary, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The river connects the Great Lakes to the North Atlantic Ocean and forms the primary drainage outflow of the Great Lakes Basin. Its drainage area is the world's largest system of freshwater lakes. The basin covers parts of Ontario and Quebec in Canada, parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, and nearly the entirety of the state of Michigan in the United States. The river becomes tidal around Quebec City. The river traverses the Canadian provinces of Ontario and Quebec, as well as the state of New York, and is part of the international boundary between Canada and the USA. It also provides the basis for the commercial St. Lawrence Seaway. The Vikings explored the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the 11th century and were followed by 15th and early 16th century European fishermen and mariners. At that time, the land along the river was inhabited by the St. Lawrence Iroquoians. As mentioned, the St. Lawrence River is partly within the United States and as such is that country's sixth oldest surviving European place name. Until the early 17th century, the French used the name Rivière du Canada or Canada River to designate the St. Lawrence upstream to Montreal and the name Ottawa River after Montreal. The modern country of Canada is one of the three nations this series is built upon. While a variety of theories have been postulated for the name of Canada, its origin is now accepted as coming from the Amerindian word Kanata, meaning village, settlement, cluster of dwellings, or collection of huts. In other words, an Amerindian community. The demonym Canadian, or Canadien in French, once referred exclusively to the indigenous groups who were native to the territory. Its use was extended over time to the colonial French settlers of the land, and later the English settlers. Today, French-language Canadians refer to themselves as Canadien Français. Let's examine the exploits of Samuel de Champlain. 
better known in English as Champlain, the father of New France. In his early 30s, experienced seaman Samuel Champlain joined the crew aboard the Saint-Julien on his first transatlantic crossing. This journey lasted two years and gave Champlain the opportunity to learn about Spanish holdings from the Caribbean to Mexico City. Along the way, he took detailed notes, wrote an illustrated report on what he learned on the trip, and gave this secret account, entitled Narrative of a Voyage to the West Indies and Mexico, 1599-1601, to to his king, Henry IV who rewarded Champlain with an annual pension. To comprehend Champlain, we must understand the character of the king he served so faithfully. When Henry IV converted to Catholicism in 1596 to end France's history of savage internecine warfare and unite the capital, he famously quipped, Paris is well worth a mass. Samuel Champlain's powerful friendship and special relationship with his monarch, King Henry IV, is in part well-documented, but also shrouded in mystery. Henry's many favors to Champlain and his family were acts of extraordinary largesse. What was the origin of this special relationship between a great king, a family of humble origins, and a youth of modest rank? Throughout his life, Samuel de Champlain was a loyal Catholic soldier. As a young man, he learned to fight with the firearms of his time, acquiring this practical knowledge when serving with the army during the later stages of France's religious wars involving the Holy Catholic League in Brittany from 1594 to 98. During this time, he attained the rank of captain. His soldiering skills, along with his talents as a navigator and geographer, would later serve him well during his many adventures in North America. King Henry IV wanted the French to begin settling in the New World in hopes that wealth could be brought back to France. So he sent an expedition in 1603 to locate a place on the North American continent to establish a colony and fur trade settlement. Although he held no official title at the time, Samuel Champlain would be among the men who would take part in this great venture. In 1604, King Henry IV granted a fur monopoly to a French noble who led a colonizing expedition to an island located near the mouth of the St. Croix River, which in time was to mark the international boundary between the Canadian province of New Brunswick and the American state of Maine. In the spring of 1605, France's St. Croix settlement was moved to a new site across the Bay of Fundy on the shore of the Annapolis Basin, an inlet in western Nova Scotia. Here, at Port Royal, France's most successful colony to date was established. The general area came to be known as Acadia. Among the lieutenants on this undertaking was a geographer named Samuel de Champlain, who promptly carried out a major exploration of the northeastern coastline of what is now the United States. In 1608, he founded France's first permanent Canadian colony, which he named Quebec, an indigenous word meaning where the river narrows. This strategic location was at the foot of a great rocky cape on the north shore, which formed a natural fortress, barring the way upstream to the interior. The early years of the Quebec colony were hard, and the population grew slowly. Champlain administered its affairs and took personal charge of an organized exploration of the unknown interior. Join me next time as we continue our deep dive into the life and times and exploits of Samuel Champlain. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs>